to break up my presentation into basically three parts. Uh, first, uh, I want to, because I want to give as much context, I'd like to give as much context as I can to the talk that I, I have planned to share with you today. Uh, first, I, I'm going to share with you um, my sense of a, uh, as a hearing poet, of a bicultural uh, poet. In other words, I want to explain to you very briefly what, what poetry <coughs> means to me. Uh, second, I'd like to deliver a, a talk to you. Uh, and then third, take your questions at this time. Mentor here at NTID, Bob Panera, said in a 
BBC uh, is from an interview I did with Peter Cook uh, several years ago. Number seven. Oh, and there's only ten of these. <laughs> the ambition of a good poet is to write something that is visually bright and clear. Allen Ginsberg, who was <coughs> my teacher at uh, the Nova Institute in Boulder, Colorado. Um, the most influential French deaf poet of the 16th century, Joachim Dubay, said, um, and this is for people that want to be remembered as poets, who wants to live in memory has to sweat and tremble.
regarding those earlier attempts at expressing diversity, is that these varieties of poets and poetry strengthened overlapping communities and allowed each of us to face, as we saw we must, whatever form discrimination took. And not only that form of discrimination we thought, or our parents, or our schools, had taught us to believe was exclusively ours. In addition, we learned firsthand that the roots of multicultural language arts lie in the strength of our overlapping communities, and that it is in the light of diversity of cultural experience and aesthetic tradition that there exists a clear, legitimate need for the qualitative study of American sign language arts and the education of our children, our college students, and our future teachers. Where do we begin this study of ASL arts? And by arts, the word art sign, I mean language arts. I mean poetry, I mean fiction, I mean storytelling. I mean whatever your thing is. Whatever it is. I'd like to share with you basic premises upon which, in looking back, I began my own study. The most fundamental premise I made in my earlier work among deaf peoples was that I never doubted the existence of a deaf poetry or poetry. It was and remains my view that all languages have their own multitudinous poetry zone. And early on in my experience with deaf people, I was aware that what may be lacking in studies of sign language and sign languages was a serious comparative analysis of poetry, not grammar of which there were an abundance. In particular, what I found most fascinating were periods of world poetry where vernaculars rose to literary power. And, 
accompanied by a boy. Uh, you may not like that either. <laughs> Thank you. 
my person was, as children often feel in situations of abuse, because I had come between my parents in a way that hurt them, or in the wrong way. In school, I found myself between educational boundaries early on when self-enclosed for speech remediation seven long years. I felt pressed between a family I loved who didn't understand me and communities of like-minded peoples with whom I had found no home. Between the great scholar poet Robert Panera and Allen Ginsberg, I stood in 1984 there at a moment of poetic transmission from golden age and beat generations. Between interpreters, administrators, club owners, trustees, board of directors, and literary centers, I stood. Between poet friends, Peter Cook, and Kenny Lerner, I held each hand till the bond was formed. This is how I would summarize the landscape from which my expression of a multicultural poet arises. It comes from a shared, often maddening sense that poets everywhere experience, in which we appear to be loved, protected, and adored by persons who only use our work to enhance or ornament their own argument, case, finding or theorem. This misuse of poetry of our calling acts in a comprehensive and systematic way 
Hello. Can we have the house lights up, please? I want to see your faces. Up, 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 up. Wonderful. That's better. Wow. Can you see me OK? Great. I feel that when you do storytelling, you need to feed off that energy from the audience. Now it's really bright. Got it. So tonight, what I'd like to do is perform some poetry, some poems, and some stories, two of each. Some of my work I decide to hold for tomorrow morning when we discuss it. I want to share more about what I'm going to be doing, and I think if I talk too much about it tonight, I'll take too much from what I'm going to do tomorrow. So we'll be discussing more about what you see tomorrow. I fell in love with storytelling around 1982. At that time, there was a lot of discussion about ASL. And yes, there had been research about ASL being a true language and all that. So it wasn't a new concept that ASL was a language. But more and more, we noticed that people were performing. There was poetry. There was storytelling. And I was growing up at this time and seeing all these conversations. And I was too embarrassed to share the things that I had within me, the, the stories and performances I wanted to do. I, I kept it very private. I didn't want to show friends or anybody. I just kept it in my head. I did come up with a poem or two back then. And the one I'm going to perform for you is about when I grew up. Now, I was shocked because I always had one concept of how I grew up until my parents just a few years ago undid my idea that I had been born hearing and became deaf later. I don't know why I got that notion into my head. My parents said, no, you were always deaf. You were born that way. But somehow, in my mind, I was born hearing and became later deaf. I knew this idea that when kids were born deaf, their parents were grief-stricken. They didn't know what to do. And so it didn't fit with what I thought about my life. And so my poem, even though it's about a misconception I had about how I grew up, I'll still perform it the way I created it. But I just want to do set the record straight and say I was born deaf, I wasn't born hearing, and then became deaf later. In front of us, we see a glowing, vibrating orb and another one beside it, two worlds. And in between them, a head, body, and wings are struggling to emerge from a shell. Time passes, and this being becomes familiar with its corporeal feeling.
Time passes. Mommy, Daddy, milk. Mommy gives me a cup. Time passes. Daddy goes away. Mommy doesn't work. I want milk, and I get milk. I want a cracker. I get a cracker. Daddy comes back. Time passes. One day I'm sick, and the temperature seems high, so I'm taken to the hospital. A man with a swinging instrument comes up to me, and places something on my chest to listen to my heart. There are notes between my parents and this man. And then, the decisive nod that gives the information. I. Find myself enclosed in a shell. I'm still enclosed in this shell. At home, I blow a feather. Someone gives me a feather to blow. It looks fun. The beautiful flowers growing all around me. Someone says, "Be careful! You'll prick yourself on that thorn." I pick flowers and smell them. I see little creepy crawly things and look at them, and I try to touch it. I see something that's scary to me, and I touch it, and then it doesn't crawl anymore. Why doesn't it move anymore? Mommy says you touched it a little too hard, and now it's dead. Too hard, she says, and it will never move any more. A lesson learned, but I'm still in my shell. I am still in my shell. There's another girl. She looks to be my age, with brown curly hair. I have blonde hair. What's your name? My name's Bonnie. I like you. And together we play and become friends. Let's go to the sandbox. Yes, let's go. We need some water. I'll go to my mommy. I say, and into the house I go. Mommy, I need some water. What do you need water for? We need to wet the sand. I look back at these memories. How sweet! Making mud pies, making sand pies. Mommy says sure and gives me the water. It's heavy, she warns. I can carry it, no problem. I say. And she gives me that heavy bucket to take back to the sandbox. We scoop it into the sand. And it changes color. When you add water to it, it becomes darker. And we imagine an oven, and we imagine the wonderful sense of baking our mud pies. Oh, it must be ready now. Have to be careful; it'll be hot. Maybe we should take off our shirt and use it for an oven mitt. Good idea, my friend says. But I'm still in my shell. I'm still in my shell. I'm thrilled when Daddy says, "Let's go, get in the car," and we drive down the road, and we climb up to the top of a hill. I say, "I want something to drink," and he says, "That's fine. You can get one soda." So I get a soda and I drink it all the way down. I want more. There's a man over there, and I decide to ask. Hi, I like you. What's your name? 
My name's Bonnie. I'm so hungry. Oh, thank you. That's so nice of you to give it to me. There's popcorn. I fill up my bowl with popcorn. You shouldn't do that. My father says, where did you get that? Oh, this guy was there, and I asked him, you shouldn't do that. Don't bother people at the deaf club and ask them for things. I'm still in my shell. I'm still in my shell. There's a man walking towards me. There's a black cloud on the horizon. There's a man who starts talking to me. I don't understand him. This black cloud is coming closer. He's moving his mouth. I see big teeth clattering. I don't understand. This huge cloud moves closer and closer, the storm cloud over me. This mouth moves, this huge tongue enunciating, moving, and I don't understand. And this huge cloud and rumbling and thundering approaches me as this mouth spits on me and keeps moving its clattering teeth and its big lips and its big tongue. And I don't understand. And I don't understand. And the thunder and the lightning are crashing all around me now, reverberating all around me. And my shell starts to crumble. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Maybe need more coffee. We'll be talking about this more later. <laughs> I do have a lot of things I want to talk about regarding my work. We will do that tomorrow. I want to do the second poem for you now. And there's always a story behind poetry, of course. I went to the school for the deaf. And you know, back in the day when I was going to school, there were no captions on the TV at all. So we watched a lot of movies. I often went to movies with my parents and us kids. We would go watch them, and of course, we would create a lot of stories in our minds because there were no captions about what was going on. And often, we would talk together to kind of fill in the gaps in the story. We'd get home, and my family, my sisters, my brother, all of us were deaf, and we would recapitulate the story. We'd try to guess what those mouth movements were, and we would then copy them with each other. So the key to learning how to be a storyteller is from that love of discussion with the parents, with my siblings, about what was actually in those movies. You know, the dinner table every night, we would sit around and we would talk so much about these sorts of things. And anything that my parents were exposed to, they would tell us the stories of them, and then we would sit and watch them tell these stories. I went to the movies quite often. And my parents had a rule. That if we were going to go see movies, it had to be Walt Disney. They felt that no other movies were appropriate for children. So quite often, if there was a new Disney movie, we would go watch it, and then we would all tell the story to each other over and over again. So quite often, my work is informed by Disney sorts of aesthetic, as you will notice. This story is about a little deaf duck. And of course, it's inspired by the ugly duckling tale, which I've changed and adapted. Once upon a time, a long time ago, we enter the woods, the trees, to a big clearing where we see a nest upon which a mother duck sits. And the father says, when, when, when? And the mother says, I'm waiting. I'm so tired. Please, when are they going to hatch? I can't wait to meet my babies. I know the father says, just be patient. Are you hungry, honey? Yes, I am. Would you please go catch me some fish? No problem. And the father duck waddles off to go in search of some fish. 
to bring back and feed the mother duck who's trying to wait patiently for her babies to hatch. While she's waiting, she preens her feathers and suddenly feels a movement underneath her. One of those eggs moves, breaks open, and out hatches a little duckling. So cute. And then the other egg starts to hatch and out hatches another one. Two beautiful, perfect little ducks and the parents give each other little kisses. Then there's a third. Out comes a third duckling. What a great day. And one after another, they leave the nest and toddle off. There's a fourth egg. Darn, I have to sit a little bit longer, I guess. It's all right, honey, the father duck says. I'll look after the other ones. You just stay on the nest. Oh, all right, she says, and reluctantly sits back on that last egg, a little resentfully, waiting and trying to be patient, and suddenly feels the movement that heralds the arrival of a different-looking duck, kind of mohawk feathers and a fluffy little tail. A little duck, a little awkward, a little different, with that little tail and the cute little mohawk feathers, and the mother's enchanted. This one's going to be my favorite. I just know it. And she preens the little duckling, who starts to try to walk away. The little duckling sees the water, sees his reflection in the water, nibbles it, and then the ripples emanate out from it, and he's delighted. He wants to touch it. And then he notices something else, another reflection, and looks up and sees the parents quacking to each other. Look, 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 the little duckling says, but sees the parents quack, 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 quack. He doesn't quite understand, but steps into that water, which is so cold. How fun. It's delightful. And then this little duckling decides to get in the water and test out his little feet. There he goes. The mother duck swims to the side, speaks to the father duck, and seems to be concerned about that little duckling. They look at each other, and the father seems to be saying, it's all right. Maybe he's slow, maybe he's lazy, something. They're not all the same. And the parents look at each other lovingly, still thinking how cute this little fourth duckling is. And they swim over to where the little one is testing out his little webbed feet. And the parents call, one, two, three, the others come. But the little one is enchanted by watching a fish under the water, decides to hold his nose and then submerges, and then comes up again spouting water and coughing after this new experience. Once more holds his nose and goes under and indeed catches his fish. The mother looks at him lovingly, so proud. Quack, 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 quack. That's funny. He didn't seem to answer. Quack, quack, quack. And then the little duck goes off. The mother duckling decides that they need some medical intervention. So they go to the big quack doctor who comes to them with his huge stethoscope and all his accoutrements in his medical bag. This medical duck comes over to the little one and the parents describe what seems to be the problem. He's adorable. There's something. I try to get his attention. He doesn't look. No worries, says the quack doctor. He takes out his tuning fork, hits it, and puts it next to the little duck's ear. He feels the vibration and looks over, smiling at the fun of this game. Then he takes out another tuning fork and puts it on the other side of the little duck's head. That tickles. That's kind of fun. Hmm. Then the consultation begins, 
And the doctor tells the parents, your little duck is deaf. Really? Yes, deaf. But no fears. Everything will be fine. We have this wonderful device. You can put headphones on the duck and wires and a big FM box on him and he'll be just fine. But he won't be able to swim ever again. But really, really, our duck will be fine. He'll be able to hear. Absolutely, says the doctor. How much does it cost? 500 fish, says the doctor. Oh, good heavens, we'll never afford it. So the parents decide to talk and figure out how they'll ever be able to pay this off. No worries, says the doctor. You can pay me off on the installment plan. Oh, thank you. Thank you for being so accommodating, the parents say. And then they fit the little duck with his headphones and a huge FM unit which weighs him down so he goes further down on his feet. So heavy, so uncomfortable. And the little duck looks around, trying to get used to this new environment. It'll take a little time, the doctor says. He has to get used to it. A little difficult at first with new sounds. The parents think, the doctor profusely, pay him his first installment of fish. And then the father works to earn more fish to be able to pay off this new device for his child. The little duck is so sad. He's landbound and has to carry around this heavy, heavy box that swings from him all the time. It's difficult to walk. He sees a cow nearby, and the cow calls out, Moo, what a strange box on you. Feeling a little put out, the little duck walks away. Sees chickens that say something to him as well, and the cow mocks him. And the little duck feels so sad because now all the other animals, whoever he encounters, laugh at him and what he looks like. Well, the little duck decides he needs to go someplace else. But walking near him is a cat. And now this cat sees him after grooming herself. Look at your box on your neck, she says. Now the duck feels insulted by another animal and decides, I need to run away. And so he packs up all his things and decides to find other happier places to live. Down the road he goes in search of another place. Here's a huge pond. And in the distance on that pond... He sees some other ducks with long necks, beautiful feathers, and they're using their wings in the most interesting way to communicate. They're smiling. They're communicating. They're not using their beaks. They're using their wings and their feathers. They notice him and beckon him to come closer. He looks around him to make sure that he's the one they're talking to. Yes, they beckon. Come on over. And so he does. This one different kind of bird says, Your earphones, that wire, that box, I used to be like you, but no more. I don't use them. Oh, I could never take them off, says the little duck. Let's try, says this new bird, and takes them off the duck and throws them away. And they spin head over heels over and over until they fall down into the pond, splash and fall down into the depths, the water closing around the top as if these things had never been. And the little duck nods. And when these birds summon this duck to follow them, He starts to move his wings and his feathers in the same way and gleefully joins them. Come, they say, 
and together this new community of different sorts of birds than the others fly away together. It's a new way of moving for the little duck, but he makes his way, and they all head out into the sunset. where they live happily ever after. And our story concludes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Now, now I'm going to tell a story. There's a hot topic that's up in our community these days. Oppression. There's a lot of hard feelings about oppression going on. Oppression means that you're, you don't accept other people for signing. You don't accept people who are who they are. And I was reading this article one day in Reader's Digest which I read from time to time. And there was this one thing that really caught my attention and gave me pause. So I thought, why don't I turn this into an ASL story? There's a lot of struggles going on, a lot of oppression. It seems like a big topic, and it seemed that the story would fit the bill. I think you as deaf folks in the audience will understand the idea of oppression and see how the ideas in the story might or might not reflect in your own experience. Okay. This is the snake story. Up on a mountain, covered with white snow, If you follow the path, you see a house with smoke coming out of the chimney. And inside you find a person who's frustrated because now their wood has run out. <clears throat> their fire is low and it's cold outside. This person needs some more wood. So she puts on her coat, her hat, her scarf, her gloves, her boots, and she opens the door to a howling blizzard. She searches through the snow that's blowing and finally finds a stack of wood. She gathers as much as she can in her arms and then she notices something. Oh my gosh, it's this brown coiled shape with a head at the top. What is that? <gasps> it's a snake. But the poor little thing, it's frozen right in place. And she thinks if I leave it there, it will die for sure. Hmm, what should I do? I know. I can bring the snake into the house, thaw it out, and then release it outside again. Perfect. Why not? And so she opens her coat and takes this half-frozen snake and puts it inside next to her warm body, gathers up the rest of the wood, and very carefully keeping her coat closed, makes her way back home where she puts the snake out to thaw. She banks up the fire until everything is warm and toasty. Taking off all of her winter clothes, getting comfy, she watches the snake revive. Slowly it lifts its head. Maybe the snake's thirsty. Maybe I need to give it a drink of water, she says. Here. And the snake laps up some of the water that was just given. Oh, look at that. 
The snake looks at the woman, and the woman looks at the snake. <gasps> Maybe it's hungry, she thinks. Hmm, hmm, what do I do? What do snakes eat? Oh, maybe bread, maybe some bread. Well, fine, I'll try bread. So she gets out some bread. And the snake takes a few experimental bites and seems to revive even more. Oh, look at that, she thinks. <gasps> It's working. That snake is feeling better. The snake raises up even more, uncoils, raises, and all of a sudden its eyes narrow, and before she even knows what's happening, its fangs are exposed, and that snake comes towards her and bites her right in the chest. You bit me. Why, she asks. Honey, I'm a snake. Thank you. So now, well, actually, I'm going to insert one more story before I go to the very last one. Uh, the last one will be more of a poem. So I'll tell one more story, and then I'll end. I went to a school for the deaf, as I mentioned before. And we were a big storytelling kind of group of kids. It was in a small town. A lot of the kids lived far from home, so we entertained each other by telling stories all the time. And I have to say, I was kind of a mean kid. <laughs> if I had a bad dream, I didn't want to keep it to myself. I wanted to tell other people. I wanted them to suffer with me. I had a little teddy bear. It was adorable. It was so cute. It had a little tongue that stuck out, and it had a heart appliqued to its chest. Its arms were open, just ready for a hug. I just loved my teddy bear. Cutest thing ever. I brought it from home, and I loved my teddy bear. If I cried, it didn't matter. I would spot it all over with my tears, and it didn't matter if I spilled things on it. It didn't matter if I beat it when I was angry. It didn't matter. That teddy bear just took whatever I would give it. It was always open and willing to accept my love or whatever emotion I would have. One night, I had a terrible dream. It was very upsetting. That's what I'm going to tell you about right now. In my dream. There's my teddy bear with its little tongue out and its little heart showing. And then the tongue was retracted and the eyes open and an evil expression overtook its features and that heart disappeared. And that bear started walking towards me like a robot. I was terrified. No, no, this is my teddy. But it started coming after me. You beat on me. You cry and get me stained with your tears. I'm going to eat you. No, no, I screamed and cried. Go away, go away. I'm coming to get you. And I ran away as fast as I could from this evil teddy bear, which advanced on me no matter how far ahead I thought I was. It was the oddest thing. Then it passed me, and it went right through a wall. I saw it go through a wall, and I thought, how on earth was it able to do that? My bear just walked through a solid wall. So I went over to that wall, and I found that I could stick my hand through the wall, too. That's strange. I tried a leg. That went through, too. When I put my arm through, it disappeared, but when I re retracted my arm, there it was again. So I tried to go all the way through the wall, and I did. On the other side of the wall, there were people hanging from trees in an evil forest. In slow motion, I looked to the other side, and again, there were trees with people hanging in all sorts of positions. And there were many evil bears 
all coming towards me, pointing at me, saying, you, you, next. No, I said no, but they advanced on me. I don't want to. I don't want to. We're going to get you, they said. No, no. I screamed, and I ran back as fast as I could, but they came to me, and I went to the other side of my wall, and I climbed back in my bed as fast as I could, terrified. When I woke up, there was my sweet little teddy bear lying right next to me. I wasn't sure I trusted it, but what I did was I went and woke up all my friends. I said, you see my bear? That is a terrible bear. He wants to eat you. I saw him. I saw him last night. His tongue went back in his mouth, and his eyes were evil, and his heart disappeared, and he said he wanted to eat me. He said that. And I scared all my friends, and everybody started crying, and everybody started screaming. Everybody. Everybody. Everybody said, your teddy bear wants to eat me. Your teddy bear wants to eat me. He wants to kill me. The supervisor, the dorm supervisor, came and said, what's going on? There's a bad bear over there, everybody said. Because I couldn't stand to suffer alone, I had to share the pain with everyone in my, in my room. Thank you. Now, the very last one is a poem. And this is a true story. It was when I was 11 that it occurred. I don't want to tell you too much because I don't want to ruin the poem, but something happened at the School for the Deaf, and boy, I have never forgotten it. I just can't let it go ever. About four months ago, I was asked to perform here and I accepted the invitation. I was so excited to be part of this event. And then this memory just surfaced. I kept trying to push it back but because uh, it's so painful, but it will not stay down. I kept trying to not face this, but now I'm letting it come to the forefront of my consciousness and I am able to share this with you. And I think maybe it'll help because it's a hard experience to deal with and I think sharing is something that will help me deal with it in my own way. It's something I can't forget anyway. I want to be able to look at it as something that just happened and then move forward from it. And it's called Honoring. The sun rises in a beautiful valley through which a highway runs, divided into two lanes with a yellow stripe. A yellow sign is on this highway. Danger, curve ahead, be careful. And a car makes its way down this road. Cars pass it, the headlights are on, there's a sign, danger, curve ahead. And as this car approaches the curve, too fast, too fast, it leaves the road and tumbles and hits a tree. It's Saturday night, football game, all the football players are announcing the homecoming queen who is not there because she died. And all the football players look at the scoreboard where there's a beautiful picture displaying this girl who would have been the homecoming queen. There is a throne with a crown placed upon it, but she's not sitting there. And all of the audience bows bows their heads, and tears fall from everybody. A car left the road. A car tumbled. And eyes closed upon this world forever. She had two deaf brothers. She had dreams. And those dreams are gone now. 
We'll all miss her, everyone says. We all love her. And she beckoned to her brothers, come with me in that car. Come with me. Join me. And as this car tumbled head over heels, head over heels, the brothers would not go. Her friends at the School for the Deaf were eating. They had breakfast that morning. And they were told that their friend had died in a car crash the night before. No, they all screamed. How can we? All the dishes fell to the ground as everybody stood up in disbelief. There were tears. There were splashes on the ground from the tears. This car that hit the tree, all the dreams, everything in her mind, everything screamed, help, help, save me. But each breath was less strong, each heartbeat less strong, eyes open and shut until they could open and shut no more. That car accident was terrible. There had been three. There were two people who'd been saved from the first two, but that one, she couldn't be saved. That sun came up in a blaze of glory. Those tears were shed. The road continued down a forested path with its yellow line dividing the lanes and a sign saying, danger, curve ahead.